greatest strength of video games as a medium is how much faith they're able to put in the player to experience their world. Unlike movies, TV shows, and books, the player in a video game has tangible control over where they go in a world, what they see, what they hear, and what they ultimately experience. Some games don't lean much into this unique level of freedom, and instead choose to deliver the world to the player in a very curated manner, whereas others choose to embrace it, and use it to immerse the player in their world in a way that only video games can. For me, these games are often the most rewarding. I value the information, the story, and the mechanics more because I actually have to put in the effort to find them myself, as opposed to having the developer serve me them on a silver platter. Now, there are many great examples of games that trust the player to experience all they have to offer on their own volition, but few made it the very core of their experience like Call of Duty Zombies did. A mode that I hold extremely dear and once upon a time used to love almost as much as my main bread and butter, Halo. This mode used to be one of the most unique experiences in the entire gaming industry, both in the way it delivered its narrative and world building, and also in the way that it played. However, as you can probably tell by both my use of the past tense and also the title of this video, that's no longer the case. Today, I want to talk about how one of gaming's most unique offerings that perfectly put on display the strengths of the medium lost its identity, and in doing so, lost me as a fan. This is the downfall of Call of Duty Zombies. One of the most ironic things about Zombies is the franchise that it's attached to. Given how unique and innovative its approach to gameplay, narrative, and the degree of freedom and control given to the player is, the fact that it's tied to Call of Duty of all franchises, one of the least innovative and cookie-cutter video games on the market, is rather interesting. And in fact, I think the contrast between Zombies and the game that it's attached to is part of what makes the mood stand out so well. The way Zombies intertwines its satisfying, highly replayable gameplay, a genuine atmosphere of fear, horror, and desperation, and a subtle hidden narrative that's embedded within the very environment of the maps themselves and is only discovered through a player's willingness to scavenge for it, is nothing short of genius. For me personally, what made Zombies so special can be diluted down into three core pillars. Addictive, accessible gameplay, an atmosphere of horror, desperation, and intrigue, and a subtle, conspiracy-focused narrative. And these are the three main things that I want to focus on in this video, because over the years, all three of these core pillars have failed to retain what made them so unique in the first place. So, let's go in reverse order and begin with the latter, because I think over time, the story for Call of Duty Zombies arguably became its most standout and unique feature. One of the cleverest things about the way that Zombies used to deliver its narrative was that it was only ever as big as the player wanted it to be. Because of how implicit it was, it was never forced on the player, distracting them while they were trying to survive. During World at War, Black Ops 1, and to a degree as well, Black Ops 2, a player could very easily play almost every map without any idea there was any story there whatsoever for hours on end and love every second of it. But then, on the flip side, the shards of narrative that were hidden within the map required searching and hunting on behalf of the player that only further served to immerse them in this terrifying, addictive universe and did so far more effectively than any other style of storytelling ever could. Sure, having information and plot delivered to you in a pre-rendered cutscene is cool and all, but that self-imposed feeling of discovery when you find a note, a radio, a picture, or a cipher that was naturally embedded within the environment that you were trying to survive in was absolutely unparalleled. 
It made you feel like you were the one personally discovering this creepy narrative that's been hidden under your nose this entire time whilst you were just casually enjoying these maps. The context they added to the locations of these maps often made you look at them in an entirely new light as well. No longer were they just glorified mazes you were locked in and forced to survive in. Now, they had greater meaning, greater purpose. They gave you the sense that there was so much going on behind the scenes in the universe that you weren't privy to, which in turn helped to create that fear of the unknown. In its presentation, zombies always felt rather small. You were boxed into enclosed and often claustrophobic environments with very few goals besides just surviving. But the elements of the narrative you could find throughout these maps made you realise how much bigger this thing is than just a few maps set in different countries. This style of implicit storytelling really reminds me of two games. FromSoft's Souls and kind of Souls-like games, and also Bungie's Marathon. It's a style of storytelling that really isn't used as much as it should be nowadays, which I think is a real shame, honestly, because it gets me so much more invested in your story and your world than just a typical, linear, hyper-curated narrative. Now, I think where modern zombies began to falter was when it became too reliant on its own lore. The genesis of the story was always deeply rooted in real-world conspiracies and the mystery that surrounded them, both in the real world and also in terms of their importance in the zombie storyline. They also served to add a degree of context to the maps as well. Verrucht was a Nazi asylum, home to many of their sick and twisted experiments. Shinonuma was a Group 935 research facility, home to the infamous Tunguska meteorite that crash-landed in Siberia in 1908. Many of the Black Ops 1 maps had a number of references to the Illuminati. Transit was home to a secret HARP research facility, which explains the inclement weather and the mysterious facility and so on. Hell, they even went as far as hiding conspiracies from other works of fiction in their maps. <laughs> You know what? Forget it. Go ahead, do your thing. I gotta say, as a huge lifelong Lost fan, this Verrucked Easter Egg makes me so happy. The excellently subtle inclusion of these references to real-world conspiracies added fantastic context to the maps, and also led to real organic discussion and exploration of elements of the story within the community. So much of Zombie's atmosphere stemmed from the ambiguity of it all. Because of the genesis of many of the mode's plot points and the questions they posed, just like the real-world conspiracies, rarely, if ever, did they get a resolute answer or conclusion. Community speculation drove the narrative far more than any developer-crafted plot point, and because the internet and YouTube were still in their infancy stages at the time, finding someone else's theories or any answers was often hard, so you kind of had to make your own. Information, theories, and answers weren't as accessible nor prevalent back then as they are now. Easter eggs didn't have full in-depth guides up within hours of maps releasing. There were no explainer videos. Everything just had this incredible air of mystery about it. The narrative really did feel like one big conspiracy theory, both in how its community tried to uncover the truth by joining the dots together, and also in how those dots were implicitly integrated into the maps themselves. And the characters that you played as only facilitated this further. They were either silent or dumb protagonists that existed to act as your vessel for exploring the world. They had enough character to make them stand out and provide funny and or badass gameplay moments. But besides Richtofen, who had his grand plan for world domination in Black Ops 1, a plan that he kept very close to his chest, mind you, it never felt like these characters knew more or less about what was going on than you did. But then along came Primus, a cast of characters who acted as essentially a rebooted version of the original four, Dempsey, Nikolai, Takeo, and Richtofen, and they were written into the story when it started going in the multiverse direction. And this is where I start to feel conflicted with my thoughts on zombies, because on the one hand, I really like Primus and how they were characterized, particularly in Black Ops 3 and Black Ops 4, 
but simultaneously, I feel disconnected from them. Because unlike Ultimus, our previous four characters, it always felt like they were privy to far more information than I was. No longer was the player character a caricatured vessel for the player to experience the universe through. Now, they were fully-fledged, fleshed-out characters with backstories, motivations, and dynamics. And this is where the zombies narrative really started to depart from what once made it so special to me. The move away from a more grounded, conspiracy-rooted narrative with ambiguity and mystery at its very core, to a more fantastical, curated multiverse narrative broke that connection that I had with the universe. Because of how curated and set in stone it was, it felt like the player had far less agency in exploring the narrative, and instead was just being served the lore and the plot points Treyarch's narrative team wanted them to be served. As a byproduct of this new approach, many of the grounded conspiracy theories that formed the basis of the story ended up being explained away and or nullified entirely by something that was written in later to basically invalidate them, and the real-world conspiracy genesis of the narrative that gave it that gritty and grounded feeling was replaced with entirely unrealistic fantastical elements. Losing that semi-realistic aspect of the story that ensured, as crazy as some of the plot points did get, they could always be linked back to something tangible in the real world made it so much harder to associate with the story. That bridge of connectivity that was formed by core foundational elements of the world being real conspiracies that exist in the real world was burnt. However, if you've been around for as long as I have, and your memory hasn't quite gone to shit yet, I'm sure you're saying, well, what about the Vrilia? So, for those who don't know, the Vrilia were an ancient race introduced in Black Ops 1 that were only ever indirectly referred to. We know about them because the Golden Rod, which was used in Call of the Dead and Moon's Easter Eggs, was a Vrilia artifact. Now, it's been heavily theorized in recent years that the Keepers, introduced in the multiverse storyline of Black Ops 3, are actually the Vrilia, and thus were technically present as far back as Black Ops 1. And although, yeah, that may very well be the case, it's not about the fact that they were present, but rather how they were present. The way the Vrilia were integrated into Black Ops 1's narrative compared to the way that the Keepers were integrated into Black Ops 3 and Black Ops 4's really reminds me of how Bungie treated the Forerunners in Halo compared to how 343 treats them. Besides Guilty Spark, the Foreigners were never directly present in any of Bungie's games. They instead chose to have the artifacts that they left behind influence the narrative to ensure that shroud of mystery remained firmly covering them. But then 343 came along and started having the Foreigners be present in a far more direct and overt way, lifting the shroud of mystery for the sake of expanding the canon. And this is almost exactly what Treyarch did with the Vrilia between Black Ops 1 and Black Ops 3. Provided, of course, that the Vrilia are indeed the Keepers, but, you know, even if they aren't, the way they treated the Keepers and the Apothecons was much more in line with how 343 treats the Forerunners as opposed to how Bungie did. And considering mystery is one of the core tenets of zombies, I don't think that was the right move. As much as I genuinely love the design for the Keepers, the way the Vrilia were integrated into the story was far more thematically fitting. Another consequence of the zombies narrative moving away from clues that hinted at greater cogs turning behind the scenes to a more fleshed out curated universe was the almost elite status that came from knowing the zombies storyline. Now, I'm gonna be honest, this is a vibe that I only ever really got during World at War and maybe the first half or two-thirds of Black Ops 1, but it was something that at the time I thought was so unique for gaming and it was very unique to zombies and it's something that, personally, I feel benefited the story greatly. Because of how subtle and secretive the narrative was, thanks to it being handled as if it were a literal conspiracy theory, you felt like you were part of some elite club for knowing it. You'd play Ascension with your friends, for example, and while they were just messing about flying around on Lunar Landers, you were thinking about Dr. Groff, about the Casimir mechanism, and what else was happening at this now abandoned cosmonaut facility. The mood just seemed like a simple, fun zombie survival mood on the surface, but 
Buried beneath that surface was an iceberg of conspiracies, experiments, and secret projects that added context to everything you were seeing, hearing, and using. And it made you wonder, what else was going on outside those map boundaries? Because the story itself was so intriguing yet so secretive, very rarely would anyone just dabble in the story. As soon as you got a taste of it, you were hooked. This super secret and inaccessible vibe the zombie story used to have only made me more interested. It's like with real world conspiracy theories, the more you try and hide something, the more curious people are bound to get. And ironically, at least for me, the more accessible and presented, if that's even the right term, the zombie story became, the less interested I became in it. Treyarch bringing the zombie story into the limelight and making it a front and centre feature for the mood showed a fundamental misunderstanding in what originally made it so great. Its inclusion was very in keeping with its themes. It was secretive, it was hidden in the shadows, and only existed for those who were willing to dive beneath the surface. The mystery and ambiguity were its defining features. They created a fantastic fear of, but also simultaneously, intrigue in the unknown. The removal of this mystery, however, was akin to opening Pandora's box. Once the player became privy to too much information and lore, the mystery of the universe was unshrouded. The fear and intrigue in the unknown was no more, because the player just simply knew too much, and the identity that Zombies had crafted for itself with that creepy, secret, and conspiracy-rooted narrative was over. Ooh, hang on. Now, I do just want to add a brief addendum to the narrative section of this video, and also as kind of precursor to the rest of this video, that even my favourite Zombies modes often lent into some of the elements of Zombies that I wasn't the biggest fan of. World at War had like things like teleportation, very ungrounded, Black Ops 1 had zombies on the moon, and Black Ops 2 had the Avogadro, right? And conversely, the kind of era that, to me, began the downfall of the mode, broadly speaking, was also full of elements of the mode that I loved as well. Black Ops 3 was packed full of secret hidden ciphers. Black Ops 4 added easter egg step hints, yes, however, the way that it did them was in a very cryptic and very zombies fashion. There's no singular map or game that I can really point to as the definitive beginning of the downfall of zombies. It was just a case of the story shifting its focus and its implementation style over time, eventually just becoming so far detached from what first hooked me on the mode in World at War that I just lost interest in it. This in fact applies to all three sections of this video, so just keep that in mind. This narrative opening of Pandora's Box had a knock-on effect on elements of the gameplay as well. In particular, easter egg design, which I see as the bridge between the gameplay and the narrative. If you ask me, the term easter egg got its modern popularity thanks to Call of Duty Zombies, and the mode stuck as close to the meaning of the word as possible when laying the seeds for its players to discover pieces of the story. However, over time, I feel like it deviated away from that. As if I've not already made it abundantly clear, Zombies choosing to tell its story via hidden interactable elements that blended perfectly in with the environment of the maps to the point of it being hidden in plain sight is absolutely genius. But as the story became more overt and kind of in your face, so did the easter eggs that delivered it. It eventually got to the point, particularly in Cold War and Vanguard, where the easter eggs feel less like secrets and more like optional quests. And this is something that Treyarch even kind of started to acknowledge post Black Ops 4, with them no longer referring to them as easter egg quests, now referring to them as story quests. One of the most alluring aspects of the zombie story was that it was so hidden, finding fragments of it, whether they were easter egg steps, radios, ciphers, or general clues as to what was going on, always made you feel like you were discovering something you were never intended to find. And this fit perfectly with the conspiracy theming of the mood. You felt like a post-apocalyptic detective trying to uncover the truth of all of these secret organizations, experiments, characters, and, of course, the zombies themselves. Although easter eggs and quest steps were, ironically, always the most curated element of zombies, how subtly they conveyed information about themselves to the player still allowed them to retain that secret and conspiracy-esque vibe that was at the core of the narrative that they were conveying. 
But over time, as the easter eggs transitioned into glorified side quests with HUD indicators, glowing outlines, and tooltips, it started to feel more like I was following a set of instructions instead of hunting for clues. Now, for the most part, even as far back as the flytrap in Darice, that's precisely what we were doing. But the game was great at hiding it thanks to how naturally the easter eggs blended in with the environment. When easter eggs were truly hidden, discovering them felt more like you were discovering something secret as opposed to just seeing a glowing item on the floor and the game telling you to hold E to pick it up. With these changes, I no longer feel immersed when doing an easter egg in the story, nor the world. And in turn, these alterations to the core philosophies of Zombies Easter Eggs had a knock-on effect on the atmosphere of the mode as well. Now that the narrative was no longer obscured and buried within the environment of the maps, much of that fear of the unknown that was so rife in the early years was lost. Because of the lack of subtlety with the Easter Eggs, the quests and how their components were telegraphed to the player, nothing really felt hidden anymore, at least hidden in the truest sense of the word. They were hidden, but with the intention of being found. Classic easter eggs never felt like they were intended to be found. They were embedded so naturally into the environments and scenery of the maps, it was almost as if they were placed with the conscious intention of no player ever finding them. But narrative and easter eggs only half contributed to Zombies' atmosphere. The other half was built by the very core foundation of the mode, the gameplay. The main bulk of Zombies' atmosphere came from the weakness and the inferiority of the player. From the get-go, you were overwhelmed, underpowered, and on the back foot, which is what I encourage you to explore and scavenge throughout the map with the ultimate goal of trying to outpace the growth of the Horde. Zombies was ultimately a power fantasy, but its greatest strength was how it made you work to achieve that fantasy. It was always dangled in front of you, and you had to chase after it using the game's fantastic in-game progression, but it was only ever temporary. Eventually, regardless of how powerful you got, the zombies would catch up to you and they would overpower you. Defeat was inevitable, it was a when, not if kind of situation. But it was that zero to hero journey that occurred on a game by game basis based entirely on how you use the tools and mechanics at your disposal within the map, that made the gameplay so addictive. Nowadays, the approach to this power fantasy is treated very differently, with the introduction of gobblegums, elixirs, weapon kits, specialist weapons, and custom loadouts, many of the scavengeable components that created that power fantasy required no scavenging. Many were simply accessible from round one, or hell, in some cases, many were accessible before the game even started, and some were even monetized. The existence of features that erode that natural in-game progression demonstrates a fundamental misunderstanding in what made zombies so special in the first place. To help create tension, addictive gameplay, and to feed into the atmosphere crafted by the maps, Zombies was a mode where being on the back foot was core to the experience. Zombies' health, speed, and number were things that you were always playing catch-up with, like I said, via the various components of the mode's in-game progression. And no, I'm not talking about XP or levels, I'm talking about the economy and how it integrated with the map. Buying doors, wall weapons, spinning the box, buying perks, activating traps, pack-a-punching, etc. The scarcity created by having a points economy made every purchase matter, and it made things like having all four perks or having two pack-a-punch weapons mean something. Not just because of how powerful these gameplay milestones made you, but also because of the journey that you underwent to achieve them. Not to go off on a complete random tangent or anything, but how well Zombies point system and economy plays off of a traditional Horde survival mode experience is why no other Horde mode, even Halo's own firefight, has ever managed to grab me like Zombies has. It creates a truly unique experience that's as dynamic as it is replayable. The gameplay journeys and stories that it creates are fantastic, and anything that looks to undermine this system or create shortcuts in it is, to me, an enemy of the formula. Ultimately, Zombies was a sandbox mode. Constantly having to play catch-up to the ever-strengthening zombies encouraged scavenging and exploration, driven by the desperation of not wanting to fall behind. It made the mode feel intimidating, 
When you spawn into a map, a weakling with a basic standard issue pistol, you know that you've got a mountain to climb if you want to survive, or you risk the horde overrunning you. And it was this mountain climb that made it all the more satisfying when you beat your highest round or when you finally completed that super difficult easter egg. Shangri-La, I'm looking at you. <laughs> That natural progression from being a weak survivor, trapped in a glorified maze with zombies tearing down the barriers to breach your safe haven, to a geared to the teeth badass, mowing down hordes of zombies, hellhounds and everything in between with a full array of pack-a-punch weapons, perks and wonder weapons, before inevitably being overrun, was the mode's gameplay loop. But unlike other games, like Halo for example, where the gameplay loop was one 30 second highly refined loop that was repeated over and over and over again, the loop in Zombies managed to span the entire game. And this is why Zombies always felt so replayable. You wanted to experience that come up again from weakling to badass. The journey that you undertook in which you were solely reliant on your own interactions with the sandbox to deliver you to the power fantasy was the mode's hook arguably more than any other aspect. Now, most of Zombies gameplay innovations from World at War through to Black Ops 3 managed to stay this course and maintain scavenging and the progression journey, as I'm going to call it. However, it was with Black Ops 3 where these core pillars of the mode began to be chipped away at. Gobblegums were introduced, microtransactions that you unlocked via loot boxes that gave you extremely powerful boosts in game. From being able to spawn any power-up at the snap of a finger and raising the perk limit above 4, to immediately pack-a-punching any wall buy or box gun for no cost, and even going as far as granting you every single perk on a map for free, Gobblegums were purposefully overpowered and were designed to act as basically a pay-to-skip option that eroded that progress journey from zero to hero that Zombies was so renowned for. The addition of gobblegums like Aftertaste, Unquenchable and Perkaholic also served to detract from the easter egg rewards as well. In previous games, oftentimes you'd get all the perks on the map, and or sometimes perma perks as well that you wouldn't lose when you go down, for finishing an easter egg it was a very gratifying reward, but with Black Ops 3 onwards that was no longer the case. Instead, these rewards were monetized. Now, I don't think I really need to go into much detail about Gobblegums because, to be honest, I think how powerful they were, combined with how egregiously they were monetized, kind of speaks volumes about the feature in and of itself. And then there was the weapon kits. Now, at face value, I can see how people would think that weapon kits were an entirely harmless addition. I mean, if anything, they're just quality of life additions, right? Just being able to customize more guns on the map isn't a bad thing. How could it be? Well, I disagree. When you're given so much control over the efficiency of your weapons, you risk making the player too powerful too early, which I felt was absolutely the case in Black Ops 3. And this is only exacerbated when it's done in the lobby entirely outside of the game. If weapon kits were somehow a feature that you could only access in a match, I maybe wouldn't have as much of an issue with it, but the fact that this is all done outside of the gameplay experience is no bueno. Part of the way the game stripped power from the player was by giving them stock and modified weapons. They were weapons the player probably wasn't used to from multiplayer, so it immediately took them out of their comfort zone and made them fight with something that was much weaker than what they typically use. But then perks were added post for Rooked to kind of supplement that and make them feel powerful again. But with weapon kits, you can just straight out of the gate give your weapons rapid fire, aka free double tap. Fast mags, aka free speed cola, and various other attachments that in previous games were pack a punch exclusive, for free right off the bat. Not only did this remove some of the uniqueness to pack a punch weapons, but it was one of the many features that just served to erode that progression journey, giving you too much too soon. Now, granted, I don't think weapon kits were anywhere near as detrimental to the zombies' experience as gobblegums were, for example, but it's just a small gripe that I've had with the mode since BO3, and honestly, I put it in this video more so to see if anybody else agreed with me. I think, ultimately, Black Ops 3 was both a blessing and a curse to zombies overall, and in that sense, it really reminds me of Resident Evil 4. 
Both Black Ops 3 and Resident Evil 4 are beloved by the fans and are heralded as the greatest their respective franchises have to offer, but simultaneously, both introduced many of the issues that led to the erosion of what made their franchises so special and what many grew to dislike in subsequent titles, myself in particular. We then get to Black Ops 4 where that progression journey was simply eroded even further with things like elixirs replacing gobblegums that although granted they weren't as bad, they still impacted gameplay, the expansion of weapon kits, a perk loadout so you could only ever have four predetermined perks on the map at a time, but worse than all of that, it introduced specialist weapons. Remember how earlier I talked about how zombies had you chasing the power fantasy via exploration of the map and also via interaction with various sandbox elements? Well, specialist weapons were the total antithesis of that. Being able to spawn with an ability that upon activation instantly knocks away all zombies, fills your armor to full, and gives you a weapon that literally does infinite damage on round one is so counter to the core zombies gameplay. There's no tension anymore because of how powerful the player is. If you happen to get stuck in a corner, well, no issue, don't worry. Pull out your pocket wonder weapon that you did absolutely nothing to earn and you're A-OK. -okay. And then along came Cold War, which is a rather interesting one because in some areas, it's very clear that Treyarch tried to scale back a lot of the BS that was introduced in BO3 and BO4. And it's very clear as well that there was a conscious effort made to return to a more classic gameplay experience. But simultaneously, it also allowed the player to spawn in with very overpowered field upgrades, essentially acting as a reinvented version of BO4 specialists, and also any weapon they wanted. Literally any loadout weapon, anything. SMGs, shotguns, ARs, or even LMGs, all decked out with whatever attachments the player wanted. This set out a meta far more than any previous game, and for me at least, it seemed to almost invalidate like 90% of the weapons available in maps. Modern Zombies seems to have this fascination with granting the player powerful key items and upgrades that should have been, or in some cases even once were unlocked as part of the gameplay, just by default for spawning into the map. Gobblegums, weapon kits, specialist weapons, perk loadouts, custom classes, field upgrades, and perk upgrades, the latter of which actually is something that really frustrates me because for years I'd wanted to see Modern Warfare 2's pro perk system be added to zombies where buying a perk would also give you like a little mini challenge to complete that fit with that perk theme, which upon completion would upgrade it. So for example, I don't know, Speed Cola Pro required you to reload a weapon a hundred times or just something as simple as that that integrated very seamlessly into the gameplay. But in Cold War, that's not the case. You upgrade your perks in the menu and all the upgrades are permanent and can never go away. With this feature, you created what was potentially a really fun gameplay loop that would have innovated a feature that at that point had been present in Zombies for 12 years with almost no innovation whatsoever, but it was done in the most boring way possible and all that potential was squandered. Ultimately, I think as soon as you start allowing for your actions in the pre-game lobby to affect your power in-game and provide options for inter-game gameplay affecting progression, you immediately start to detract from the scavenging for survival gameplay that once acted as the core of zombies. When the player is handed more and more free power and the hurdles they have to pass are made weaker and more inferior by comparison, the end result is a journey that, while yes, maybe more accessible to a larger audience of players, lacks that kind of underdog-born gratification that was once the foundation of the mode. Many games nowadays fall for this trap, believing that giving the player as many powerful tools as possible right out of the gate to immediately provide that power fantasy will hook them, and maybe in an era where most people's attention spans have been ground down to single digits, it could hook them. But ultimately, this leads to a far more shallow experience that lacks replayability and long-term interest because so many of the challenges the player has to overcome are shortcut by external features. Zombies was a far deeper, more engaging experience for me when the power fantasy was achieved via natural in-game progression and when achieving all elements of it was a struggle, not when it was handed to the player from the get-go. 
So many of the little things as well that once helped build the tension in Zombies were slowly removed as well, in favour of ensuring the player was as powerful as possible at all times. Now, these things may seem really small and insignificant, but things like being able to shoot while drinking a perk, being able to buy every single perk from a single machine, and the lack of any pack-a-punch animation. These were all things that were previously trade-offs for getting a powerful upgrade that helped to balance them out a little bit and make sure even as powerful as the player was getting, there always felt like there was a degree of tension and weakness there. Like I said, these are all very small features, but when it comes to crafting an atmosphere, it's the little things that count. That's pretty freaking sweet! Something else that I think zombies lacks nowadays as well is defensive gameplay. At the end of the day, it's still a zombie horde survival mood, and it used to be very in keeping with the wider zombie genre in how its maps were designed to have you play. It was a very traditional kind of hunker down and survive zombies mood. I always loved how games used to play out like traditional zombie movies, with you and your friends holding out with backs against the wall, slaughtering the undead as they flowed towards your little safe haven before being entirely overrun. It really felt like an interactive, addictive version of Night of the Living Dead, but over time, it lost that defensive element with the default gameplay becoming more offensive, running trains, throwing yourself at the horde, etc, etc. Now, this is not a modern zombies problem by any means. It's a problem that I've had with the mode since Black Ops 1, and I felt it largely detrimental to the atmosphere of the mode overall, because rarely now do you feel like you're forced onto the back foot being overwhelmed. Unlike in World at War, where maps felt like they were designed specifically to be rather claustrophobic, with certain areas intended to be holdout spots, maps started becoming too open. No longer were you frantically searching for a place to hold up, bordering up windows and killing as many zombies as possible before they breach your safe haven. Instead, you were actively inviting the zombies into the map so you could round them up like cattle and gun them down. Tense, back-against-the-wall moments that were so prevalent on the Darius catwalk or on the Verruck's butcher balcony are few and far between now. Now, granted, to give credit where it's due, it does seem as though there was something of a conscious effort in Cold War, both in the map design and also with the field upgrades, to go back to this kind of style of gameplay. A few of the Cold War maps have spots that feel like they were purpose-built for holding out over training, bringing back that classic Darius catwalk vibe, and also the field upgrades, like Ring of Fire, for example, encourage the player to hunker down in a certain area and hold out, instead of running around power sliding in circles. Defensive gameplay still wasn't anywhere near as prevalent in Cold War as it was in World at War, for example, but I appreciated the conscious effort to try and bring it back. As someone who grew up fascinated by both zombie movies and conspiracy theories, Call of Duty Zombies was like my dream video game experience. It had me hooked for years, and to a degree, it still does have me hooked, but over time, my genuine excitement and love for the mode has waned. As I hope I've made it very clear in this video, I find it impossible to pinpoint one game or map or iteration of the mode that has definitively marked its downfall for me. Truth be told, elements of the mode that I've loved since 2008 have been degrading since as early as Black Ops 1. Like with many franchises, its downfall wasn't a binary flick of a switch, but rather a gradual loss of sight of what made the mode so special to begin with. And with how its unique properties intertwined with one another to create this perfect storm of an experience that is almost entirely irreplicable without being a one-to-one -one carbon copy. The gameplay informed the atmosphere, which in turn informed the narrative, but simultaneously was also informed by the narrative, and the easter eggs played into all three at the same time. But over time, the priorities of zombies flipped. It was at its strongest for me when the gameplay was simple and accessible, but with this insanely deep, dark, and inaccessible story hidden beneath the surface. Later titles, I feel, flip this on its head, putting the story front and centre, thus making it more linear, more clean and accessible, and the gameplay became a lot more complex and inaccessible, requiring what was once classified as an easter egg just to do something as simple as turning on the power. It was at this point where I think Zombies started to lose sight of its hook. 
The gameplay captured me because of how repeatable, addictive and simple it was, and the complex mysterious story that was hidden naturally within the world had me searching every damn pixel of a map to find clues for the future. But nowadays, Zombies seems to lack almost everything that once made the mode so special to me. And so, there you have it. A video that I have wanted to make for over six years now. So, sorry if it ended up being a bit long and a bit messy. I had a lot of thoughts that I just, I wanted to include in this video. Like I said, this video has been a long, long time coming. Regardless, I want to give a massive thank you to both Jay Rizzo and Mr. Roth Waffles for their help with this video. They both offered some absolutely invaluable input, so please, somehow, if you haven't done already, make sure you check them both out. The links to their channels are both in the description. If you enjoyed this video and you want to help with my effort to branch out and make this channel about more than just Halo, then I'd really appreciate any support you want to show down below. And if you're new here and you haven't done so yet, then maybe consider hitting that sub button if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more like it. And with that said, let's round this absolute titan of a video out here. I want to give a massive thank you to all of my amazing patrons for the continued support over there. And thank you all so much for watching. I really appreciate it, especially if you've made it this far. If you made it this far, bravo, bravo. Thank you very much. And I'll catch you all in the next one.